getting healthcare data right. Moderator for the session is Ms. Brahmjot Dillo, healthcare analytics solution and delivery leader, Marsh McLennan. The panelists for the session are Mr. Parth Day, founder and CEO, U4RAD, Welcome, sir. Dr. Hemant Kumar, visiting faculty, FMS Delhi. Dr. Vivan Jain, principal consultant, Synergy Digitals. We have our virtual panelist, Dr. AI, as well with us over here. Good afternoon. You know, I was uh, intending to start this off with a joke, uh, and and I almost agreed with Sachin that we shall do a yoga session because the glucose levels are going to be low, and we need to ensure the glucose levels come up. So, if anybody wants to grab a coffee, but I can certainly tell the people who are in the room you will not be bored for a single minute. Um, and I want to stand because one, I'm quite short, so you probably can't see me behind the table when I'm sitting down. But also, I think one of the other reasons is I am not a doctor by profession at all. Uh, we have a number of amazing people in this room who are clinicians who come from a medical background. I actually work for an insurance broking firm, uh, one of the largest in the world, which is Marsh McLennan. And my day job is that I actually lead healthcare data analytics solutions design for the company which basically means that I work with a number of client organizations, SME, mid-market, large sector, um, and just to name Amazon, Google, Flipkart, all these are clients, Microsoft, right in India. And what we do with them is we try and use data, healthcare data, appropriately so that the employers can create the right benefit management plan for the employees. I'm sure, although most of us are in the medical space, we know, we've heard of the great resignation post-COVID, there is a massive talent shortage across the world, right? People don't want to come back to work and most employers, just like hospitals, I'm sure, and uh, you know, other medical institutions have shortage of talent. How do you ensure that you use healthcare well as a means of retaining people and attracting talent to your organization? That's basically what we do. And my qualification for being the moderator, I think, uh, of this session today is data. So that's what I bring to the table, literally, which is how do you use data very, very effectively in the healthcare space to make decisions to drive health outcomes, right? So that being said, um, again, just a very quick summary. In my opinion, in my experience of the last 20 odd years, what I have seen is, uh, you know, using healthcare data is the way to use healthcare data is very, very simple. You are basically trying to identify pockets of illness or where is the illness prevalence. You're trying to create preventative measures. We've spoken about preventative measures extensively over the last two days and we touch upon that a bit more. Um, but then ultimately what you do with that data is that you, other than creating preventative measures, is that humongous amount of data that you've now collected can be used to design products, services, plans for the future, you know, for the generations to come. So what I would love to talk to our esteemed panel today about, um, and I'll start with introductions, Dr. Heman Kumar. I think at this time I'll sit down, sir. Um, so Dr. Kumar, you guys have heard, is a faculty at FMS. He also has worked in consulting with the World Health Organization and Ministry of Health. He has an immense interest in technology. Um, he's currently running his own health tech startup called healthboard.in. And uh, we are a lot of people here with interest in technology. So this is one theme that I'm sure you guys will enjoy throughout the session. Dr. Vibha Jain is a digital healthcare professional. You've already heard um, you know, of what she does at the moment. But one of the bits that I absolutely admire about Vibha, other than the fact that she is another woman in this field of digital health, 
um, is that she's very, very passionate about implementing large digital change. And she's got a wealth of experience, both good and bad, of using data, which is what we want to share with you today. We want this to be a practical session and actually tell you that before we go to the end of the world and do the best AI in the world, AI can make any data, right? To do any kind of analytics, insight, you know, you need the right data. And how do you start the process of capturing data? Um, and finally, we have Partha. So Partha today, uh, you already heard, is, is a founder of a startup. But more importantly, I think Partha has also worked with IBM, you know, immense technology background. What I have suggested to Partha is that we talk about the full ecosystem of data, right? So what I do not wish to do is, you know, talk the ATA throughout uh, the one hour we're with you, but we'll try and break that down into what does that mean throughout the journey of a patient, of a life cycle of a patient, right, when it comes to preventative care. So if I can start, you know, the first question um, from you, Dr. Hewan, right? So. In terms of technology, right, uh, when you and I were discussing, you said, you know, people in medicine need to become evangelists of technology. We know that people are very scared of using Excel files. I mean, forget everything else, right? So, um, data seems everything to, to do with technology, uh, but frankly, that scares a lot of people here. So, how do you adopt technology? Where do you start, right? Um, and let's talk about the people in the room at the moment. Where do you think they can start the adoption of technology? I, uh, thanks for uh, inviting uh, me here. It's, uh, it's a great panel, and uh, honestly, the audience looks empty, but the people I think who should be here are here. So I'm really happy. So whoever you are, I, I'm addressing you. Great. So uh, I have. Uh, I'm a medical doctor and I've spent uh, 20, 25 years uh, in the field and I uh, I work with uh, technology companies uh, and I uh, teach health management uh, courses as well. So I've interacted with a lot of clinicians and one thing that <clears throat> I've noticed is that uh, there's this medical term called phobia. Uh, medical people almost have a phobia of uh, anything sort of data related. Just historically in India, people who would go into medicine are the people who hate math. I, I, I remember uh, my own self, uh, this is not uh, somebody else. Uh, 11th standard, I went there with my father and the teacher said, uh, which team you want? And my father, those were simple days. My father said, uh, what are the choices? He said, maths dila do, engineer ban jayega, bio dila do, doctor ban jayega, ya maths bio dono dila do, jo man karega, wo ban jayega. Uh, I end up uh, being on this side. But generally, the, the background is that math and numbers and anything related to data kind of scares us. That was fine 10, 15 years ago. Now the world has changed. Even if you want it, you cannot live without data. You cannot live without technology. But medical education, pedagogy is, is kind of frozen uh, in that area. And it, just gets uh, perpetuated. Uh, me and Viva were discussing the kind of books we read and why doctors are the way we are. Of course, there's an enormous amount of workload that uh, doctors are facing, and there's very, very little that uh, you know remains for them to do outside. But to answer her point, I think there is a very definitive role to have you know some primer on technology, right in the MBBS, BDS. Uh, curriculum regarding if you are a healthcare professional you're getting an MBA in health management you should uh, understand about uh, data and uh, sort of uh, digital aspect of things this is what I was discussing with uh, Dr. Dabhutesh as well uh, I will explore the possibilities of this idea is very very close to uh, my heart uh, how to get digital technologies in front of uh, people who deal with uh, healthcare and allied uh, professions the point to start would be that you get into any course that touches healthcare. I think a basic literacy, a basic sort of deep phobia, uh, you know, uh, process. That that's how psychiatrists would <laughs> treat people with phobia. They give you small amounts of things of the same stimulus and tell you know, look, you will die. You will survive in any way. But so you you you'll get there. I think, and and the role for all of us here, and the reason I said I'm happy here, you are here is. 
you made a point to be here before everybody else uh, after the lunch. I think this idea clicks with you that health and the digital aspect of health is important. And I think that's what I would exhort all of you as well. That wherever you are, I think just propagating the idea that data and internet and health, they, they're complementary. Uh, another aspect of uh, what she asked, there's a very definitive fear that this thing will, is going to replace us. 20 years ago, there used to be bank strikes when the ATMs came and there was this whole technology. Everybody thought, my job is going to go. If a machine is going to count notes, what, what the catcher is going to do? If the machine is going to uh, make the uh, drop, what I'm going to sign on? I think a lot is there with the doctors on this aspect as well. That if I'm allowing a machine like uh, Pata's uh, software to just diagnose what an X-ray is, what the hell am I going to take the uh, patient? Right? The machine is already told I have uh, pneumonia, right? I'm going to Google and find out what antibiotics I need. I think these are some of the things uh, which, which need to be addressed and definitely a role right at the start of uh, education on, on a basic uh, primer on technology and at examples of people who are in this room on how they are adopting technology and flourishing as uh, doctors, I think Dr. Trish is a great example. She is uh, another great example. People who are uh, clinicians and are uh, sort of surviving and flourishing in the, in the digital world. Thank you for that, Doctor. And we're talking to a bunch of millennials here as well, right, who absolutely love technology. So I won't be surprised if we have some very smart doctors who are very hands-on with technology and I can see uh, him nodding, <laughs> he's saying not them. <laughs> Definitely much more. Much more, much more, right? So embracing technology certainly is one part of it. But even for the ones who are non-millennials, and I'm one of them, um, you know, I think, look, it's less about the digital adoption. I think it's really essential to understand that everything you touch today, whether it is a BMI score, whether it is, you know, a simple health risk assessment I was talking to, uh, Dr. Gaur earlier about the health risk assessments. As an organization, we are in the business of doing health risk assessments for our clients. We use that data, we augment that data with everything that's happening externally as well, right? So, if you, for example, all your lifestyle based diseases can be figured out using data. And again, I'm speaking in non medical terms as a data analytics person. The importance of that information that you're capturing, uh, you know. And I, my humble request to people who are clinicians here, my humble request to the students who are here, who probably want to move into a space of data analytics in healthcare, you know, there's a, there's a massive opportunity there, is think about all the possible areas of data capture, you know, uh, everything that's on your smartphone, to your wearable devices, to the World Wide Web, and Dr. AI is gonna to talk to us in just a while, all the information that's out there is all data. How do you try and bring all that information together consolidate and make it meaningful so you can start drawing insights out of it. Now with that, I'll turn to Dr. Vipha. Um, your amazing experience of obviously implementing some large scale programs. Dr. Vipha, easier said than done. Yeah, uh, you've had the experience of trying to bring the data together, you know, and uh, trying to run an AI program, digital transformation as well. What has been your experience, the good and bad both? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, for me, to ask, actually, I mean, this, this actually has uh, taken me back to the days when we were starting this journey. And uh, to be honest, I started this journey with Rex Hospitals because they were the first to visualize that data is something which will be required in the future. And to have the data coming in, there has to be a system in place. Uh, I mean, at that time, we didn't hear of NLPs or the OCR. So the paper prescription was something which was, which was not possible to collect the data on, so they decided on to have that PHR. That was a big project in itself. Uh, it has learnings, and, and at one point in time, I think management was at the point of saying, we don't want to have this PHR, it's too costly for us, we actually are going to do away with that. I mean, that, that, that was the point when we were like, it's three, four years, we have been working on this too hard, convincing all the clinicians over there, convincing all the people over there to start using it, and now the talks are coming up, actually, doing away with that system. I don't know if it was fortunate or unfortunate. Today I can say it was fortunate. We had a breakdown of a half an hour in the hospital. So the doctors were not able to use those EHR to prepare their discharge summaries or enter the notes and all. And the kind of human drive which was there, it actually gives a, gave us a boost. Because then the doctors were like, where is my note? 
मैंने डाला था कहा गया मेरी डिस्चार्ज सुनी नहीं दिख रही है कहाँ चला गया सारा कुछ सर जस्ट जस्ट वेट फॉर हाफ एन आवर वी रिस्टोर एवरी थिंग बैक टू यू यू गेट एवरी डेट ऑफ यूर कोडिंग सिस्टम एंड दैट वॉज द डे वेन पीपल स्टार्ट इज रियलाइजिंग द पार ऑफ डेटा सो दे हैड दैट फोर ईयर और फाइव ईयर डेटा विच वॉज अवेलेबल टू दैन इन फ्रंट ऑफ दैन तो आज ही आज की तारीख में इज फॉर्चुनेट दैट इट है Right, people were thinking for that, but yes, it 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 was a good good thing. And then, uh, I would say it's it's a journey. It's something when you have that kind of a vision to start using that digital system. I I understand that comes with all all its pros and cons. So it's not that it's a fault uh, faultless system or a hundred percent perfect system. Uh, nothing is perfect. Like uh, we are in the human life, we cannot have that kind of a risk factor reduced to point zero 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 one. It will always be there. But yes, that data is the starting point of it because, uh, I mean, unless and until you know what is happening to the patient and recording somewhere, and you want to have some insights coming out of it, you will keep on relying on the books. You will keep on relying on the research papers which are there. And then, as a human, you have a limitation to how many papers you can read, how many books you can read. So, what digital does for you, or what technology does for you, is bringing that kind of relevant information. Consolidate at a single place for you to refer to. But having said that, it is important that you know. I mean, I'll just take an example of say Wikipedia. You need to understand what question you need to ask. आप अगर question ठीक नहीं पूछोगे, you'll not get the answer right. And this, that's the same with the data. If you don't put in the data right, you'll not get the data right out. That was a journey we took, and it, I think it, it was almost a decade that we we actually reached the stage. I would not say we are hundred percent there. Obviously, we cannot be saying that. But yes, at least the doctors are at least not that much averse to the fact. The practicing doctors. And at this point in time, when I started, I was like, why the doctors are not using it? They should use it. It's so simple to use. Very simple. In the morning, I think there was an example. If you are able to use a Facebook, why can't you use an app? You can make it use it. So somewhere down the line, I I actually moved towards the doctor side. Look for a. Intensivist who is in the ICU for a 12-hour duty. It's never a 12-hour duty. It's a 14-hour duty. And imagine yourself sitting in the ICU with 14 uh, sick patients with ventilators on four of them, and that kind of sound coming out at a regular interval. And after 14 hours or in the ICU, somebody comes to you and say, "Sir, I brought a very good app for you. You can be with your patients 24 hours by seven. First, let me go and sleep." It is I need a one-hour sleep because all the patients in between are like, "What will happen to my mental health? What will happen to my mental health? What will happen to my emotional health?" And that's where I think there has to be a balance which needs to be there in terms of what we are giving to the doctors. <coughs> is it something which is really helping them, and is it really which is something fitting in their ecosystem? So, as a doctor, I would probably like to know out of those fourteen patients, there are two patients who are critical, two sodium. Levels I have sent for uh, an examination, and only those two forty levels I need to know. Rest of all, fine. When I come for the round, I'll take it up. So that's that's the kind of uh, intelligence, or I would say that's the kind of information which has to go into the app, so that that is useful for the doctor. So that's been the kind of uh, learnings which have come. So if I start talking about all the learnings, I think it will be not enough this session. We can go for taking on. But yes, you have to start uh, with a journey. You have to have that mindset of having the data uh, it is important and that was one thing which actually helped us in enforcing that thing within the organization when we started showing them the outcomes so we started showing them look you uh, gave this kind of treatment to this kind of diagnosis of patients and this is the mortality mortality rate which is coming up and the first question was this is not complete data i don't have all the patients over here your data is wrong so the answer was yes it is wrong because you have not entered the complete data you enter the complete data i'll be able to give it to you So the thing was, the system was capable of doing that thing for you, but if you're not inputting any data, what will happen to that? Nothing will come out of it. So the the one learning which I got was, it is a collaboration of people, process, and technology. It cannot be one thing in isolation. So all these three have to work together for any implementation to be successful. Absolutely agree with you, and uh, we used to call it PPT back when I was in management school, which is people, process, technology. That was a consulting jargon. But just coming to that point, and before I I bring Partha into the conversation, one of the things that we have seen in 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 my current role, and we work with seventy six different countries, healthcare data is not clean and easily available anywhere, right? 
whether it is the NHS horror stories that you hear in the UK, uh, you know, US obviously is slightly farther, but the rest of the world, the healthcare data is available in pockets. It's extremely unclean. But some things that have worked in some parts of Europe is that there are, you know, government frameworks in place at the moment to look at data in such a way, healthcare data, where they started to do a lot of analysis within the government agencies itself. So they're looking at, for example, sickness absence. So they work with employers of all kinds. How many times Logan and Chutti have because of illness? You know, that data, records of that information. They look at historical data of illness. I mean, that's a different story. Europe may, Hamare Tana, India may where, you know, the care is easily available. But in other parts of the world, people use the insurance policy to go and actually get themselves tested for a simple flu. There's your data point. But what the government has done as a result of that is used all that data point to try and create trends and patterns to identify avatars or personas of people with specific disease types and start building prediction models. Okay, start building prediction models on human behavior. Obviously, this is not done in isolation with the medical community. It's, it's together with the medical community. But there's a lot of work that's happened in that space. A lot of learnings that we can implement in our country as well. Obviously, again, it starts with data capture, right? We'll talk about that a bit more, but I'll, I'd love to uh, invite Partha into the conversation now. And Partha's immense experience in this space, one of the things I requested him to talk about was how do you start building that ecosystem where you collect the data and make it meaningful. So. Good afternoon. Thank you, permission, can I stand up? Thank you so much. So uh, I'll stick to the point for the discussion today is data and the data, getting the data right. Uh, when we're talking about the data, uh, we should look at that what we do with the data. There are a lot of times we collect the data because we want to collect the data. So the first question we need to ask us that why I need to collect the data? And the challenge is how much I need to collect? Why people start talking about that there is a Always, uh, people say that, okay, I am against entering so many things. Why they do it? Because they don't see any value of it. If they see any value, they will do it. They will ask for more. Today, if you talk to any of the operators, they never see anything coming out of the data that they enter. And it is being entered because of some discussion has happened in the boardroom and somebody wanted some information to be captured, which will never be seen. And this guy who is entering the data, he is probably entering some data which is not as useful as what the other data should have been entered. So the challenge for us is, first thing first is look at that. When we are collecting the data, what is the data we are collecting? How much of the data we are collecting? It becomes a fatigue for the people for the data collection process. We have to come out of this. We have to collect the relevant data and the data which will be useful for us is not a dream that I will be collecting the data today and in 10 years later somebody will be using the data. A lot of data we have seen in our analysis has been collected, has never been looked at at all. Number two, when we talk about data, we must talk about the quality of the data. Quality of the data comes in two ways. One, in, in which format data is being captured. Number two, the real data when we are collecting whether the data is actually correct. So correctness and the format. Format, unfortunately, is a reality in IT. So irrespective of whatever the machine learning and NLP, etc., what we say, at the end, the data is not correct in the format. Analysis of the data becomes extremely uh, difficult. I'm sure you will agree with that. Most of the time, we have data. The data is not in the right format. We can't just do everything with the data. It's a challenge. So can we get the data format right? And a very basic information, whenever we capture the data of a patient in a HIS, how we are capturing the data, whether the first name and the middle name and the last name, they get captured differently than when the data comes to her, she can't just make analysis. It takes much more time for her or other analyst to get the data format right and then do the analysis. That becomes a challenge. So let's first thing first, is that when we are working on the data, see that how we are going to look at the data format right. Very basics but very important topic for us to consider. If we're not getting the data collected in the right format, then the analytics, et cetera, cannot be done. Number two, when we're talking about the exactly the content of the data, how we ensure the content is correct. And the data content only correct 
on, only can be corrected at the point of collection. It is, you know, sometimes I compare it with how you segregate biomedical waste. So when I started my career in Delhi, that is the time when the biomedical waste came. We all started looking at the different colors of beans. Before that, we never had any clue. Then we realized that if you are not able to segregate at the point of collection, you will never get it right. You can expect a rag picker to find out the needles and then throw it in a different bin. It is not possible. It is only possible when we are collecting at the right time. Exactly the same way if the data has not been collected or entered rightly by the operator, then later on nobody can correct it. We have done the exercise enough time in our life and we found it is just not possible. So even if we have to focus little more on the correctness of the data to be collected at the point, that is something we have to look at. And this is only possible coming back to my previous point if we are collecting, if we are collecting the right amount of data. So a balance has to be maintained that what we are collecting, how much we are collecting. And to me, if we are collecting less, but if we are collecting that in a right format and collecting with the right content, it is much more significant and useful rather than collecting a huge amount of data. People do talk about data as a new oil. This is a similar problem like a oil. There are a lot of oils available, but you can't extract them. Because you find out that if you extract, what you will get out of this, this oil refinery need to spend too much of money and you will not able to get the real oil out of what you will take it out. So there are a lot of time it happens. We have a huge amount of data available, but they are not useful data. Nothing comes out of it. And that the frustration builds everywhere in this ecosystem. The frustration is with the guy who is entering the data because they are collecting huge data, they don't see any value out of it while they are doing it. And you talk about top management, they will also find the same thing that we have invested so much of money with so much of tall promises. At the end, whenever I have to look at for many data, somebody will say, don't you change. You talk to any IT guy and say that, hey, I will ask for any data and immediately it is available, answer is wrong. If it is, then why we are not having board meetings with the data coming from SAP or any other ERP? Why I need to get the data extra to the Excel? You know, what is the most common request I have seen with all the larger companies that I have worked with? Data Excel may export over now. I like you, why? Why you need it? It will happen, but it will change. It is a question. If the data is not going to get exported to Excel, then you know, the software will go to Excel. I am telling you in the beginning of it. I said, no, you don't change it because Excel may have to be fed that you are going to claim the data, you can change something, what you don't want, right? As a consulting company, you should tell them that guys don't make any changes to the data, the sacrosanct data, which only can be done when it's coming from the system, don't claim the Excel. Now, name any company who are not using Excel for board meeting presentation. There will be none. So, if you are very confident about our data, we would have told, Give rights to all the guys, now we are in COVID pandemic, we are not having physical meetings. Give rights, every people should be able to see the data directly from the SAP or Oracle or any other ERP software the organization is using. So for us, it's very important that we collect data, which is correct from a content perspective and correct in a format perspective. If that happens, we can do wonders. AI, etc. will come much later. If we are not having basic data to run MIS, what AI we are talking about? AI will learn with the wrong data. It will do a complete different things what it is purposed for. So let's talk about AI a little later, maybe after two years in a conference. If we are talking about data, right? Let's talk about how we get the data to be collected at the point of care in the correct format, in the correct content. Thank you so much. Thank you for that, Parda. And obviously, I think everyone's taking you and standing up because the glucose levels need to <laughs> need to rise. Because I see a few people sleeping in the audience. I'm going to walk around here and do a bit of dance now, babe. Now, jokes apart, I think uh, in a, a very important point raised that you know you will do AI eventually, but first, can we a dashboard create or something like MIS file banana something? Can we just put all the data sets together and see what is the story uh, that the data is showing? Uh, and that's something we do, right, as part of the analytics. So I, I actually agree. We do a lot of fancy analytics where we build predictive models of member behavior analytics and things like that. But it all starts from a simple graph, right? A simple, simple graph that is talking about cost and talking about 
you know, how uh, advanced is the medical condition, right? Very, very simple graph. Um, but, you know, the people in this room, Partha, they're also thinking, Kyam, I have to be an IT and a medical professional also. Yeah, what do you expect me to do both? Right? It's impossible. I mean, we are not here to scare you. But I think a, a really essential question is, and I'll come to you, Dr. Kumar, is what are the kind of roles do you see? Because I think we've all agree, we discussed this as a panel as well, that data is a slightly different and a very specific role. Right? Absolutely amazing if you come from a medical background, but within your ecosystem, maybe you should have some roles focused on data specifically. So, uh, I'll just take you back just a little bit. Uh, everybody here has probably heard this uh, thing that data is a new oil. Uh, I hope all of you have heard about it, including the consumers. Data was, uh, sorry, oil was discovered around at the turn of the 20th century, uh, 1880, 90s in Texas. Quite literally what happened was that people realized that there is something important in my backyard. People were actually digging in their backyards trying to discover oil. Now, oil, uh, you probably haven't seen what oil looks like, but when you see an oil slick, you realize it. Oil is actually called crude. The thing which is pumped out is actually called crude. That is exactly true about data as well. It's, it's crude data. So, people in Texas, if you go to US, you might still see people actually pump jacks in their backyards pumping out oil. That is true about most of us. Most of us are going to be professional. We are. Each of us is going to generate data. Right? Kesa hai, kitna hai, kis quality ka hai. And everybody's, it's like the bigger organizations are now kind of squatting on it, saying, look, I know something important is there in my backyard. It may be very pricey, but very important. I'm not going to let anybody hands on it, and I'm not going to deal with that as well myself. Now, that is the big problem. We are sitting on oil, and we don't know what to do with it. India is a billion plus people. We will achieve data sets of exceptional quantity like nobody else does. COVID app, 2 million doses. Nobody even has the second largest vaccine app would be like not even 100 crores. You look at UPI transactions. You, you look at uh, any transaction, billions. I have no problem that if we get it right, the data right, the data sets, the data that we can produce out of India is going to be exceptional. We are actually sitting on the largest wealth in this whole universe. But again, the problem for all of us is this. There is oil, we don't know what to do with it. To connect to a refinery, what trade is it? As Pata said, is it actually what? Digging it out of the uh, uh, backyard or not? If it's too bad, if it's too dirty, it's not going to be much its life. So the roles that we need, and just if you may say, well, to the point that you had just discussed before, I just stuck to me. Data is going to be produced by health professionals. Doctors are going to produce it. You guys are going to run a hospital. You're going to produce the data. And you have no background into digital literacy. You look at the idea. It just struck me while sitting here. Doctors and health professionals are going to be producing this data. And they have no idea as to why is it going to refine it? What's going to come out of it? What will be useful? What will be making a role? And what will go into an aviation turbine too? I think what we need is very well defined roles before the AI black box. How we are generating data, as Pasta said, in what formats, data governance. A lot of big hospitals, I, I was fortunate enough to work at Max when they were deploying the, uh, the, the EMI. A lot of big hospital chains have lots and lots of uh, data there. They have security officers, they have IT officers. I doubt somebody has a data governance manager, a data quality manager. Nobody is looking at it like, oh, I'm producing like this 100 million gallons every day. Is it making any sense? Is this pathology, is this lab data? Is it, is it, is it making something meaningful? And let me call clinician pathology and say, guys, you created so much. This is interesting. Or get the intensivist and say, look, your ventilators are showing this much. But this is something really interesting. That is not happening. Why is it not happening? There's no role for it. There needs to be chief medical information officers. There need to be data quality managers. They need to be data governance people. What data is going to which division? Eki logging se pura word waste time. The whole word, you know, the, the desktop gets logged in in the morning, never logs out. Everybody logs into the same machine, uh, uses the same machine, the same login, sees everything. Kya kiske paas hai? 
And after a while, again, I come back to Parliament. Gets messed up so much, nobody knows where it started. I think we have to recognize this, all of you. You are primary producers of oil. You're all Saudi Arabia sheikhs, by the way, okay? Please understand this. But get it right. Understand what it can do. Understand where it can do both. And be very mindful of it. And understand this whole technology. Because when you produce the right format, the right type, when are you capturing, who are you sharing with, how are you contributing to the overall uh, ecosystem. We get this right. The box in the middle, which is the AI model. That's done. These are the techies. Uh, you know, Sachin Gaur is working at the competition. These guys are working on these models. They, they'll get it right. They already have. Alexa now understands your language. You know, Google understands it. Getting that beach car box, I think everybody is focusing on that AI part. To me, that is nearly sorted. Those models, techies work, they, they sort it out. The input is in the problem. Input is not right. And the, the reason it is not right is this only. A literacy, and I think the clarity and granularity of roles that we need, of what this data means and what different roles people need to have to manage, produce, segregate uh, the, the, this, uh, this oil. So that's, uh, I don't know if this rant sort of made any sense. So. It did actually. And it's, it's a rant and look, the techies are actually clapping for you. And so there he is, the rank really worked. And just from the experience of, you know, leading a data governance team today, which was a very difficult journey. And I'll just come to the roles question again. We promised you this is going to be a practical session. Uh, and for those of you who walked in late because lunch was so important and data was not, sorry, you missed it out. So go back and look at the recording. Um, anyway, so data governance is, as he was talking earlier about data custodianship, right? There is going to be a lot of change in the space of data privacy in the coming years in India. I'm sure you all are following this, right? The data privacy laws are being looked at. And most of the countries that we work with, you cannot, the data needs to be de-identified at source, which means I cannot figure out such and gore, what is his age, or is male, female, what are the diseases that he has at the moment, how many times did he actually go and visit the doctor. All this data is available. But I can't access it. When I say I, an organization with the right intent, also cannot access it because of data privacy. I need to go to such and get explicit consent. The right over here, sign karo ke tumhara data use ho sakta hai. Now, unfortunately, that doesn't happen in India as well as it does happen in other parts of the world. But that is changing. And that is changing with Disha, right? Which is the data privacy law that's coming in place. Now, when that starts to happen, you know, people who are at the helm, who are doing this analytics and insight are worried because we do not have ways of capturing data. Whatever data is currently available, it is very uh, piecemeal, right? And I was talking to Kushbu over lunch as well. You know, the amazing what the Zyla is doing, what Ultra Human is doing. They're all trying to capture data in these pockets. There is no ecosystem that allows us to create us, you know, there's a framework to try and bring all that data together simultaneously, but you clearly can do that. So some of the rules in data governance are what? You basically need a data custodian. So who sees what data? Somebody needs to classify the information, index it, clean it. I'm telling you from experience, and my team actually won an award last night. It was, it was an award night for us. They spend, this is analytics people doing advanced machine learning, spend 60% of their time cleaning the data, right? So this is the reality of healthcare data in our country and the most parts of the world as well. So data governance is important, data cleansing is important for it to be then made available for analysis. But then let me, let's talk about the privacy law, Dr. Vibha, right? Now we, once this privacy comes in place, how do you see that changing things? I mean, <laughs> uh, changing things as in like, uh, I would say data privacy is, um, so I am Dr. Vibha and I would not like anybody else to see my data. And that's that's the most scary thing which can happen to me. I mean, that, that's what happens. I open any app and it starts asking all kinds of questions. Allow notifications, allow camera, allow recording those things and all those things. And I, I get scared that, that time. Whenever a patient is going to the hospital, he's going, I mean, that's the last thing he has done, right? He's worried about his health or his uh, relations health. He's trusting that hospital to keep care of that data, which is actually going in there. 
that's that's the sense I have, and I'm, I'm talking of the experience because I've been working also in the hospital settings. I've never been on the other side, so I'm trying to move. But that's that's the, all the thing. And at that point, the onus actually lies on the people who are providing the system for the doctors to input the data. That they make the system so secure or so uh, robust that these things are something. Which are which the people should be aware of, which the doctors should be aware of, which the patients should be aware of. But that is not the first thing which comes to their mind when they are inputting that data into the system. Because if that is the first thing which comes into their mind, they're not going to input the data, and which is what we require, what the data analyst would require, what a data governance person would require. So, uh, data privacy, data confidentiality, yes, they are important, and I believe these guidelines are important. Uh, not in just uh, listing them out on a website for everybody to follow, but actually there should be some guidelines which go into the vendors also, into the people who are making those products which are being used uh, as terms of getting certified. So if I say this particular product is a certified uh, certificate A of security, and I know what all goes into that certificate A, it becomes easy for me as a consumer to understand look, if I'm taking this particular product, it is all one, two, three, four, five. It's all done. I don't have to worry about data privacy, right? I understand there, there has to be. So it's it's both ways actually. It's about the uh, government making the guidelines, and it's also about about the people who are actually having the data. The data belongs to them. So it's a kind of a talk which which has to happen, so that nobody says uh, I am at a loss. But this is something which we have to take care of. Definitely, we have to take care of. And in the space of hospital, I would say. As an e, as a customer, if I'm going to five hospitals, I might, I would like to have my data in a single place, and I would not like any hospital to utilize my data without my permission. That that's something which is to be there, and that's where the data privacy or the confidentiality that becomes important. Uh, it's it's still a topic to be debated. It's not has been debated as much as we're talking about AI or MLs or or the data or even the EHRs. But I think there has to be some talk about this as well when we actually are modeling our products. When we actually are developing the, the the models, even for the AI world, but fine, it's it's a de anonymized I mean, data. It's it's something which is nobody can uh, decipher anything if I'm taking that. But I think yesterday I was attending a session and the people were saying, I think it was with uh, Dr. Mahajan also. He was talking about the 3D model, right? So I have your images. I I have your images, and if I do a 3D construct, I am able to make out which face is this. I don't have that name attached to those images. But if I create a 3D model, there are ways I can identify them. So is is this something also to come into the data privacy? That is something which we need to discuss. There is no right or wrong answer in there, but we need to discuss and to agree that this what is the right uh, approach to it and what are the right guidelines which should, should go in. But yes, there has to be some kind of guidelines and there have to be some kind of certifications going when you are doing that product. That will really help the people. That's what I understand. Absolutely agree. And I think Look, at, you know, data is the oil has to be extracted. We've all heard different views, right? Um, now, when it comes to privacy, we'll see what happens with policy and what happens with policymakers. Hopefully, Dr. V. Kissing has some input to give into the policy making as well. So you can pass on our message to the government of India who are building out these policies. But I think one of the things that we definitely want to start doing is capturing that data larger, right? So when, as a panel, we were discussing the largest hospitals in our country are a big source of data, and I don't think they realize this, right? And we were saying it's almost a moral responsibility to try and, you know, one, protect that information because it's information of patients, but it's also structure it in such a way and bring it together so we can drive meaningful insights. We can identify with historic patterns, which are past years, what's happening, and we've got a small exercise we gave Dr. AI, and we figured out with Dr. AI how accurate Dr. AI is in, in his prediction. We will say it's a his because men can make mistakes, women don't. So, uh, <laughs> and the women clap for me, so there you go. <laughs> no, but the point is, I think we need to start thinking about this, and particularly the students in this room, I would urge you, you are the future of this country, to start thinking about what are those sources of data, and I say this to my team all the time, you know, where can you capture that information, how can you bring it all together, we will put governance frameworks in place, ensure it is clean, it is used for analysis, all that good stuff will happen. But we, as I said, we need to start capturing the data appropriately in places. Now, with that, I want to bring Parthaya back in. 
Now, in your experience, right, what are some of the outcomes that perfect data is able to achieve? So let's uh, look at a couple of uh, practical examples. Uh, when we talk about data at the end, what do you want? You want actionable insight. Uh, the insight has to be such which can be actioned with by people and with the time deadline. So that's the way we always. So if you look at there are certain things, I mean, uh, taking uh, a couple of projects that have been implemented in the country, uh, particularly you know uh, for Max and a couple of other hospitals, where actually uh, there are ways they are able to find out. Who is the patient looking at their data? Where in an ICU they give more right? So uh, these projects are very successful projects. Have been implemented. So once we look at the data and we look at the, some pathology data value, the doctors are able to really pinpoint among the hundred patients lying in the ICU who required for cancer detection. If we are able to do this kind of project more in number, there will be there will be people who will be coming to us and asking that why don't you capture data? Because now we know. If they have captured the data, what is the benefit they have got? The challenge, again, I'll go back, is that they are not able to see much of those successes, what has been implemented and helping them to reduce their time and making them more effective in clinical outcome. Wherever they have seen that it is helpful to them, these guys are all for it. I'll share one example when I started implementing uh, uh, EMR since 2007, 2008, uh, for other software. Uh, so we were uh, having a challenge, and that is the time um, a lot of our doctors uh, were kind of, if I use the word, forced to um, uh, ask for force, whatever the language you can use. Discipline. There is no paper. This is a paperless hospital. You have decided to join the hospital. You have to use it. You have got no option. Uh, and uh, and I've, I've been called by several times by several doctors and said, that, "Do you know who am I? What is your salary?" Uh, mine is 10 times than yours, and all this discussion I have in my head. That I can just throw you out and you will never get another job in your life uh, if you do this and if you don't allow and all this stuff. I said, okay, that's fine. And I had a situation, maybe six months later, somebody called me and Dr. Babu had a question. I said, yeah, this guy was kind of killing me. And I was uh, handling operations that time. Uh, so it was not very easy for them to throw me out because operations, if I'm an IT manager, IT with me, I would have been paid by them. But I was head of operations, so I had uh, some control in other places. Uh, she said that uh, I want to have coffee with you. I was surprised. You know, what happened? I said, Aaj nobody here. Kisi ko then the discussion happened. You know what happened? Yesterday there was a patient came in, and the patient was threatening me to take to court. And not only take to the court, they were threatening that I'll kill you. And it happened. You know, I'm sure in a lot of real life examples, it happened several times. There are times when patient parties really get aggravated because of something has happened. Now he said, you know what happened? This guy told me a completely different story now compared to what they have told me. What I did, I have just looked at my EMR, I found everything I have recorded. I have just shown him the computer that worked. This guy just left. Because they found there is no case. This doctor has recorded every conversation, what they told. And the conversation, the changed conversation, what they are bringing to the table right now, there is a huge difference. Now, so there are multiple outcomes. There are outcomes which help you to help the patient. There are outcomes which help you to avoid legal actions. You know, we start practicing more like US guys nowadays talking about that, okay, first we have to see that whether this will create a legal problem for me or not, and accordingly think about the best having the patient. Right? So those examples actually help. But if you ask me that whether we have this kind of examples in thousands in number, answer is no. If that been the situation, then most of the hospital, they would have come and talked to everyone and then we have a complete different discussion that we have so many willing users and how we are going to help them out. So that's not the session I have ever seen. The always sessions are all about that how we make somebody use the system. It's not about the willing user is telling that guys, I have to use it. Uh, give me a different kind of system. So again, coming back over there is, is important if they see value. Like everything else in life, this will also work. But seeing value out of what they use is very important. Another point I want to mention, and this is more from, uh, and this is more from uh, private 
uh, or uh, my own uh, way of believing things. So there is a toolkit for our data monetization. Right? At the day, people said that what they will do is that the data will be oil if you can get money out of it. Oil is not for using in your own, right? So you have to get money out of it. And the data monetization at some point of time is becoming a data inclusion in your life. So I always keep telling that we have to have a definitely a very important balance. In the name of data monetization, I cannot share the data to 10 other different companies, which is happening now. No, some, and then that becomes an inclusion in your private life. That whenever I am trying to do something, people are following me. Everybody knows that I am right now doing a conference sitting over here and talking on WhatsApp. And who are my co partners People do talk about privacy. My mobile phone is listening to whatever I am telling you. If I talk about something tomorrow morning, I will get an ad. If I open my Facebook, some ad would come related to any things that we discussed. Right? So, it's very important that it should not be an inclusion in our life. So, when we started uh, our startup to do something in home diagnostics, uh, we have decided not to have an app where there is any permission required. So we have a portal. We don't take any permission. We don't store any data from the patient. So we are very clear. We only capture the data that is required. Four to five things, and that's it. So we are not in data monetization business. We are in a business where we provide services to the patient. And beyond that, there is nothing. So yesterday it happened. Somebody came and said that you, you are doing services in Delhi and said yes. So that means you know who are the patients where you have done X-rays. I said, yes. Okay, now there's an opportunity for us. So there are 10 things that you can do with this X-ray result positive of this. I said, yes, you can give me the data. I said, no, I don't have it. So you are telling you don't show the data. I said, no, I don't show the data. So while this is important, we always feel that you know we should have data which should be used for other purposes, but we have to clearly remember that it should not be an inclusion in someone else's life. We should not cross that line. Somebody has given a, uh, called us for the X-ray, and I know that person is suffering from, let's say, tuberculosis. I should not pass the data to a company who is making a tuberculosis drug. Now, this could be foolish for me to say that, but that's the way we are thinking, and that's the way we believe that we should stop somewhere. So that's very uh, important. Uh, aspect for us, well, uh, outcome uh, from the data uh, is important, but drawing a line with the privacy of the patient, what Viva was telling, that this should not happen that Viva called me, she said, I said, I don't know, 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 that should not be there, and that's the point I'm trying to make. Thank you very much for that, Partha. So, yes, please. I think we'll, we'll wrap the session one because, as I said, those of you who are late for the data session, you're called, uh, right? Uh, but I, we would want to run a Dr. AI once, right? So if you can, the question that I gave Dr. AI was, that Delhi is cold, pollution levels are high. Hai. Dr. AI, can you tell me, in six weeks, mein kaun kitna padega? Yeah, because it's an AI tool, it's a prediction tool. Ideally, it should work. And the response was, And this is, these are fields from the World Wide Web, okay? Very specifically for New Delhi. I don't know if you can blow that up, yeah. Can you guys read that? The students certainly can, right? It looks like a thesis on air pollution. Now, why am I showing this to you? Because the simple logic of data is garbage in, garbage out. So if you do not have meaningful data that the web can actually access, where it tells you that in Rohini, you know, in this particular area, both intelligent low rigs are gathered away, the pollution level is X, you know, and on an average, the age group is, you know, 27 to 30, um, um, 27 to 30, uh, you know, what are the disease patterns that you're seeing at the moment and what can you expect? There are 20% chances of respiratory tract infection. That kind of insight is possible. It is possible if you have the right data entering the system and hence, there won't be garbage out, there'll be magic out, right? In terms of data analytics and insights. Yeah. Okay. So just to, to wrap up this session, thank you very much, our esteemed panel. But what I will leave in terms of a key takeaway from this session is, yes, data is your oil. Data is going to be extremely important to do basic stuff like MIS, make a dashboard of health, and then do amazing stuff like AI. 
we need to have people who understand data and talk that language, even if it is a small, simple data custodian or data manager. You know, start from there in a healthcare practice, right? Because exactly to the point my esteemed panel was making that each one of you, and I can see Dr. Amitrajan with with Lexis, huge amounts of data is getting collected with all of the you know tools that you are using. If the data was to be brought together and given to somebody like a Bramjo to analyze, that person could draw out amazing insights. So to that point, work with technology, work with data people. We are not medical people, but we can help you. Thank you very much, everyone, and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you to all the panelists for letting us understand how important this data in healthcare is tied to and its role and the importance of MIS and obviously our Dr. AI. Uh, with this, I would request I would request Ms. Bamra Brandur Dillon, I'm so sorry, to felicitate other panelists on behalf of Innovation Curious. And yes, we all, I mean the students here are ready to dance along with you. We are all pumped up after the session. How is the Josh guys? Hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Park, Dr. Park, Dr. Park, Dr. Park, I would request you to fel felicitate Ms. Ramza Dillon. <laughs> and we should be welcome with a loud round of applause, guys. Please.